As the summer waned, Jesus and his disciples journeyed southward to the land of Judea. In the village of Bethany, Lazarus and his sisters were preparing for the autumnal feast of the tabernacles. Hold it for me, will you, Mary? Mm -hmm. Oh, glad you... Oh, haven't you finished yet? Just about. We keep tying me down. But well, this is no time for childish games. Our guests are coming and we're not nearly ready. I'm ready. Aren't you, Mary? As soon as my finger heals. Are you out of your minds? With the house to be clean, plates to be washed, brass to be polished, the courtyard to sweep, tables to set, the pants to be sanded and the... Oh, Martha, Martha. I'm tired already. I'm exhausted. You know, we'd better rest for an hour or two. I think we should. I know you're joking, but this is no time for it. Not with the rabbi from Nazareth coming. And his followers. And the most important people in Bethany. Mm. How can you just stand there doing nothing? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Lazarus, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. I am. Well, then you finish the courtyard. I'll go help her. All right, Mary. We are greatly honored to have you and your followers as our guest master. All Bethany, indeed all Jerusalem, has heard of your teaching and your powers to heal and to cure. As I have explained before, Lazarus, I would have no power if it had not been given me by God. And as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Truly I say to you, he who believes my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. The hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Mary. Mary. Master, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. Martha. Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. Only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. During the week of celebration, Jesus went to the city of Jerusalem to worship at the great temple. And in keeping with the custom, he taught in the great courts to all who sought him. My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man's will is to do his will, he shall know whether the teaching comes from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. Lord Well, well. The Nazarene has drawn an even larger crowd than yesterday. Yes, I've heard that. But why did they flock to him? That's what I want to know. Why does a crowd gather around a juggler or a street magician? They're credulous, curious, unthinking. They've heard exaggerated stories of his powers to drive out demons. A five-day wonder. Next week, they'll have forgotten his name. They haven't in Galilee. Not in a year of weeks, according to the reports. In Galilee, they've nothing else to talk about, except their crops. But here in Jerusalem, they're more worldly wise. I doubt it. We heard their talk all around us. How can he have such learning when he had never studied under the wise ones? What can we learn from a Galilean? He has a demon. He seeks to lead us astray. And you, Shufka, are you in agreement? Not completely. Did you hear any man say he believed the Galilean? No, nor did I expect to. Not with you and I there in our robes, and with the temple guards at hand. And I noticed there were many there who did not speak against him, but watched him with a love, a reverence almost. He has a magnetism, an effect on men. He could be dangerous. Mm. Yes, yes. The next time he asks us to make a report, I suggest we agree on our conclusions before we voice them. 
I know, I know. A penniless, wandering teacher. A leader of fishermen, a publican, and a handful of backcountry peasants. But today, and yesterday, and the day before, he won new followers in the temple courts. Mark my words, Caiaphas, if he continues... There have always been upstart orators in the courts of the temple. Since Solomon's time, Hillel's. Even when you were high priest, worthy father-in-law. But this Galilean is different. They are all different, but they are all alike. They are nothings, nobodies. I have more important matters to see to than uninvited critics from Galilee. We'll discuss it later. At this moment, my presence has been demanded by His Excellency Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea. About the temple funds you loaned to him? I hope so. I'm eager to see how well our whispered accusations have succeeded. Your Excellency, I'm not in the habit of being kept waiting. I was in the inner temple when your messenger arrived. It was some time before I was informed that you had requested my presence. I do not request. I demand. As all Judea knows, Excellency. May I? By all means. Some months ago, I suggested certain construction in Jerusalem, principally an aqueduct to supply water. An ambitious project, Excellency, one that should win you great favor with the Emperor, unless it proves too costly. We discussed the cost when you volunteered to supply the funds from the uh, temple treasurer. Agreed, yes. Volunteered, no, Excellency. The suggestion was yours. Don't twist my words. The question is too trivial for discussion. You think so? Seems to have become the main topic of conversation throughout all Judea. Indeed? The same lie told over and over till now all Israel believes that I use the temple funds by force. Oh, deplorable. Just when the world was beginning to trust Tiberius' pledge to respect the laws and religions of the conquered nations. How unfortunate if this rumor were to reach Rome. I have reason to believe it has reached Rome. And what's more to the point, I believe I know where the lie originated. Excellency, your abilities amaze me. We have an old Judean saying that it's easier to find the, the field where a breeze begins than to trace the birthplace of a room. This wind smells strongly of temple incense. If you have any definite proof, I will give you my utmost assistance in locating ah. it. Pinning the guilt can come later. The important thing now is to stop the lies at once. You, as high priest of the temple, will make a public proclamation to the effect that you volunteered the use of the funds willingly, eagerly, and without coercion. As you command, sire. If you are quite sure that's what you wish. It's what I demand. Why do you question it? Because of these uh, unfortunate rumors, the people now believe that you forced surrender of temple funds. Now, no matter how sincerely I were to deny that, they are sure to believe that I was ordered to say whatever it is you wish said. Do you have any better suggestions? Excellency, there are two methods, either of which might succeed. Speak out. Return the money to the temple. Build the aqueduct with funds from Rome. With funds from Rome? Waste empire wealth on a conquered nation. Suggest that Caesar pay tribute to a captured land. <sighs> what is your other plan? Return the temple funds. Say that your artisans have decided that the aqueduct is impractical. But I have already said that it is practical and badly needed. Not from a Judean point of view, Excellency. Not even desired. The people are satisfied with wells and water bearers as they have been for centuries. They have no desire for Roman pools and fountains and public baths. You mean they'd rather see their wealth lay in temple coffers and put it to public use? 
I mean they will submit humbly to the will of the Lord. <sighs> These Israelites. Crushed. Conquered. And still claiming to be the chosen people of the one, only, invincible God. I'll never understand them. Alexander the Great said much the same thing. Excellency, the answer is really quite simple. The people know they have sinned against the Lord. They submit to Roman rule as part of the penance the Lord exacts for that sin. This is a submission that has saved Rome many legions, much work, and considerable bloodshed. And it will go on so long as the high priests advocate it. We have proved worthy of our hire. My father-in-law in his time, I in mine. Enriching yourselves immeasurably. It is not easy to maintain leadership of the oppressed while serving the interests of the oppressors. <laughs> Nothing traitors haven't done before. I do not regard myself as a traitor. Your Excellency. I am a practical man. I am a realist. Preventing rebellion and insurrection. Growing rich in the doing. As for the proclamation, you may announce I find the Judean rabble too ungrateful to be deserving of worthy projects. Ah. And that the funds? They will be returned. As you command, sire. Now, if your excellency has no further suggestion. Just this. Rome won the world with the sword, the spear, and blood. Just because Tiberius chooses to rule by persuasion, courts, bribe-bought men, the uh, conquered sometimes forget the sword and the spear. I am certain that Israel, at least, is well aware of Roman strength. Sometimes the two pampered are inclined to consider themselves exceptions. Ever since I first became procurator, you've blocked my plans here, sought to outwit me, mock me, Discredit me with Rome. Oh, sire, I assure you, I have sought nothing but your good. Believe me. Believe you? A traitor hired for his skill and treachery and bribery? Oh, no. I may be a soldier. Slow in the arts of politics. But I'm not such a fool as that. Sire, let me assure you. No, I... enough. Valerius gave you your position. I can break it and you just like that. I'll be off. And you convinced him he had to return the funds? Or face a reprimand from Caesar. Uh, Romans, Romans. <laughs> Children ruling the world. Hmm. Children with swords. I, uh, waited to discuss the matter of the teacher from Galilee. But we can ignore him now. Ignore him? Why? When we spread word that you have forced return of the temple funds, your prestige will be invulnerable. We can't count on that. Something went wrong. Pilate. Pilate. Like a growling dog, he's stupid, he's surly. He's ready to blame anyone and everyone for his own mistakes. He should begin to think the people would accept a new leader. The Nazarene must be driven from the city. Or killed. But this afternoon you called him a nobody, a, a nothing. What would you have me do, wait until half of Israel follows him and Pilate learns of it? No, no, it was just... If he said... speaks in the temple again, have him arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. Very well. On the last day of the feast, Jesus came again unto the temple and taught. This is in Galilee. Captain. Yes, my Lord Gavis. Arrest the Nazarene. Quietly. Bring him here. Are you angry with me? Because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. You have said that all who hunger for God's blessings may have them. 
But what are we to do? How are his gifts to be earned? If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. This man speaks truly. He is really a prophet. Could he be the Christ? Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Who knows from where the Messiah is to come? It is written in scripture that the Christ will be descended from David and come from Bethlehem, the village of David. Not from Nazareth, in the wilds of Galilee. When the Christ appears, will he do more than this man has done? All you preach are ties to the temple and submission to Caesar. I oppose the first man who speaks of God and hope. You fear that he is the Messiah come to expose you hypocrites? Wait here while I get that blundering fool out of trouble. Lower your voices. Would you desecrate the temple? It is not the people who defame the temple. It was the priests who started the trouble. Stay yeah. and listen to the gallery. Yeah. My lord Caiaphas. Why did you not bring him? As you were ordered to do. My lord. No man ever spoke like this man. Are you led astray? You also? Are the authorities, the Pharisees, believed in it? No, no, my lord, but the people... The people do not know the law. They are accursed. He is a false messiah, deserving of punishment. Guilty of blasphemy. Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Are you from Galilee also? You will search and you will see that no prophet is to rise from Galilee. This is a matter that must be rendered beyond dispute. Excellent. Master, a question. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? It was not that this man sinned or his parents but that the works of God may be made manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night comes when no man can work. Who speaks? Who are you? As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Go wash in the pool of Siloam. When he came to his home street, the neighbors gathered around him, marveling. And he told them that his sight had been given him by a man named Jesus, whom he had not seen. And they took him to the Pharisees, that they might question him. And he put something on your eyes. It felt like clay. And told you to wash it off. At the pool of Siloam. And when you had done as you were told, your blindness was ended. 
Yes, my lords. And you say this took place yesterday? Yes, my lords. On the Sabbath? Why, yes. This man Jesus is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Only a sinner would violate the code. How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? It is written that clay cannot be prepared on the sacred day for any use. But the great teacher Hillel stated that in particular cases... Hillel, th Hillel, I am weary of Hillel's exceptions. Shammai has ruled that the law is the law to the last letter. And this Nazarene has broken the law. He is a sinner. My man, what do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? Why, he is a prophet. You may step back. His uh, guess has no value. He didn't even see the Nazarene. Perhaps he did. Did? Did what? See Jesus? We have only his word that he was blind. This may be a trick. Man's parents are here. Why not ask them? Please, come forward. Is this your son? Who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? I know that he is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. If you have been given sight, it has been by the power of God. Give God the praise. We know that the man Jesus is a sinner. Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I know, that although I was blind, now I see. But what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciple? You are his disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses. But for this man, we do not even know where he comes from. Why, this is a marvel. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he has opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. But if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Silence! Silence! You were born and not to sin. And you would teach us. Guards, take this man away. Cast him into the street. <laughs> And Jesus, having heard what had occurred, sought out the man. Samuel. Shalom. Alechem. Was there something you wanted, sir? Do you believe in the Son of Man? And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? You have seen him. And it is he who speaks to you. Lord. Lord. I believe. For judgment I came into this world. That those who do not see may see. And that those who see may become blind. Rabbi, what about us? Are we also blind? If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. And Jesus and the twelve went out from Jerusalem and up into Galilee. And a day came when he sent them forth to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. You received without pay. Give without pay. Take no gold, nor silver, nor copper in your purses. No bag for your journey. 
nor two tunics, nor sandals, nor a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. As you enter a house, salute it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. But all I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils and flog you. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear testimony before them. What you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, utter in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim upon the housetops. And have no fear of those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground without your father's will. Yet you are of more value than many sparrows. He who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Let us go now. And he sent them out upon the first mission of the kingdom. Andrew and Simon called Peter. James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Matthew, the publican, and young Philip. Bartholomew and Thomas, the doubtful. Thaddeus and James, the son of Alphaeus. Simon, who had been a zealot, and Judas of Cariot.